Hi, everyone. It's Chip here. Welcome. Today, we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, Kingdom Living. Wow, this is one of the most important teachings that Jesus gave, and it's one that we need today. Now, let me just tell you right up front the reason that we don't understand the gospel, the teachings of Christ, the Christian life, is because we've missed the kingdom of God. Okay? And this is something that happened a long time ago. This is something that started with Constantine because Constantine, his influence on the church brought a mixture of uh, the world and the church, the state and the church. Then you have Augustine. He came up with a whole new way of understanding the kingdom. And then the reformers, the Protestant reformers went back to Augustine. So it's just a big mess. What we need to do is recover the gospel of Jesus, the Christ, the son of God. And then in the framework of who Jesus is, what his message was, what the kingdom of God is, we need to recover his teachings for the church today, for us today. So that's what we're going to set out to do. I encourage you to watch the last video I made on the apostolic preaching, the ancient kerygma. It shows what the apostles were preaching, what the gospel proclamation was, and that is so relevant today, so important today that we get that right. That's the foundation, and then we build upon that. Okay, and this teaching here, if you listen to the other one, it just flows right into this one. If you watch this one, you can go back if you haven't, or you can start with that one either way. So let's dive right in. The gospel according to Matthew. Why did Matthew write his gospel? Now, of course, we know there are four gospels, the one written by John being the last, and it's not one of the synoptic gospels, which means it has a different character. It has totally different sections in it, a whole different uh, approach. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all similar. They all cover a lot of the same material. Now, what's interesting about Matthew, uh, his writing, is that if you compare it to Mark, for example, Mark is very basic. It has that story of Christ. Now, all of the Gospels were really just expanding the ancient kerygma, just showing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that's explicit in every Gospel. It's explicit right at the beginning of Mark, at the end of John, and in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in the middle with Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Psalm 2 King. And this ties in with Jesus' proclamation, his gospel of the kingdom, proclaiming the kingdom, and then the apostles proclaiming the King, King Jesus. Okay, It all goes together. Now, the difference with Mark and Matthew is Matthew has added a lot of Jesus' teaching. And so the purpose of Matthew's gospel can be perceived. If you look at the end of Matthew, where he has recorded Jesus saying, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, right? Matthew 28. And so Matthew, being obedient to Christ's command, he thought, What better way to do this than to put Jesus' commands, his commandments, in the form of the gospel? within that gospel narrative, show his life, show his teachings. So the additions in Matthew are for believers, they're for disciples. That's one of the things we need to understand right away. And so Matthew is really a manual for discipleship. And so it combines the kerygma with the diache, the proclamation with the teaching. Okay. Now, the Sermon on the Mount, the context and the significance, this is Jesus' first uh, big block of uh, teaching recorded in Matthew. Matthew actually records five sermon sections, if you will. And these five sections are reminiscent of the five books from Moses. And in Matthew's mind, he's communicating something to the disciples, to the Jews, showing that Jesus is that fulfillment, and he's bringing that new kingdom, that new covenant. Now, um, one of the things we have to understand is that this sermon is directed to the disciples. It says in Matthew 5, it says, And when he, meaning Jesus, was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, 
and then the Sermon on the Mount follows. So this teaching is to the disciples, right? What happened? Jesus saw the multitudes coming, so then he moved to a more mountainous area, probably so the crowds would not overwhelm him. If you read just before that, at the end of chapter four, all these people are coming to Jesus to be healed, to be delivered, all of these different things. This was a time when Jesus wanted to teach his disciples. So he moved to a strategic location where he could accomplish that. Okay, that's what the Sermon on the Mount is. Now, it, we have to realize that there are Christians today that just completely dismiss the Sermon on the Mount or that think that Jesus was just saying, you know, holding up a mirror saying, look, look at you. you no matter how hard you try, you're not living right. And so you need to be forgiven of your sins. That's actually, that's not what the Sermon on the Mount is about. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus saying, hey, there's a new kingdom. I'm the king. And if you want to be in the kingdom, this is how you got to live. Okay. Now, also for the early church, Matthew was the go-to book for Jesus' teachings, for the Christian life, for discipleship, etc. And uh, portions from the Sermon on the Mount are all throughout early Christian writings. They're in the Didache, which is a collection of uh, instructions for the church. It could be late first century, early second century. Um, and also the second century apologists like Justin Martyr or Athenagoras, they highlight the Sermon on the Mount to show this is the Christian way of living. And this is what Christ taught. But the emphasis is on this is how we live. This is how we live. That's how they understood it. And so that's how we ne need to understand it as well. Now, the goal here in, in this video is not to just go systematically through the Sermon on the Mount. I, I could never do that. <laughs> but I'm going to pull out the main themes. Then once you put these, once you get these things in place, you'll be able to go back and read it yourself. You, and, and it will help you understand all of, all of Jesus' teachings, really. But the key here is to pull out the main themes, understand what's going on, and then we'll be able to read it and understand it properly. Okay, so we'll start here. The main theme, the law of Christ from Matthew 5, 17 through 48. And so this is after the Beatitudes, but Jesus says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So the first thing we need to understand is that Jesus fulfilling the law and the prophets, it wasn't in the sense that he, in his own life, did all of, all of the law. He, he followed all the law completely. He lived a sinless life. That's not what he's trying to communicate. What he's communicating is, I'm going to finish the law. The law wasn't complete because the people under the old covenant, the Israelites, they could not receive this kind of teaching. They could not live this kind of life. Okay. But what Jesus is doing, what he does, who he is, he is going to make this way of living possible for his disciples. And this is what God wants, right? Think about when Jesus said, to those whom much is given, much is required. Okay? So God is giving us so much more by giving us Christ, but he also requires more from us as well. Okay? So moving on, he says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. This is one of his key points. Now, the scribes and the Pharisees, they actually were trying to keep the law. Now, there are other things around that where Jesus was showing them how their efforts to keep the law was actually kind of backfiring and was kind of, you know, creating this way around what God's law was was instructing. Okay, so but the point here is for the in referencing them and to the people in general, their understanding was these are the people that are keeping the law and that is what they are doing and that's what they're trying to do. Okay. And so Jesus is saying your righteous has to righteousness has to exceed theirs. 
Now, what kind of righteousness did they have? They had external righteousness, right? We can read about um, what Jesus says in Matthew 23, right, to the scribes and Pharisees. They had an outer righteousness, but their heart wasn't right with God. Their motives weren't right. And they had hidden sins like pride, hypocrisy, and all of these other things. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, I want your heart right. I want your life right. I want everything right. You want to be in my kingdom? It's going to require all of you complete righteousness. Okay? And that's why he's saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They will be filled. Jesus is looking for people that want to live right. Remember, he's setting up a kingdom in which righteousness dwells. He's saying, anybody out there want to live right? Come into my kingdom. Do you want to escape the pollution of the world? Do you want to escape escape the corruption of the world? Do you want to escape the judgment that's on the world? Come. Come into my kingdom. Okay? And so... Paul calls this in his epistles, he calls this the law of Christ. It's also referred to as the law of the Spirit. But Jesus, he goes on in this section to say exactly what he means. So when he's saying, um, you know, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, right? Right? But he's saying, but if you have hate towards your brother in your heart, that's murder. So that's how Jesus is fulfilling the law. He's taking it to that completion. So it's not just an, a law that, that relates to our outer actions, but it relates to our inner heart desires. Okay, Jesus wants complete transformation of, of every individual. Okay, And so he's contrasting, right? But I say to you, that's through this section. Okay, you've heard it said to those of old, but I say to you, it's a contrast. It's something new. Okay, and this is Christ's law, outer righteousness and inner righteousness, right actions, right thoughts, right words, everything. It, it's our complete life in harmony with his will. That's what God wants. That's what Christ is teaching. That's the kingdom way. Okay, so that's this section, the law of Christ. The next main theme is the kingdom of God. Now, there is some confusion about what the kingdom of God is, and I think that's sometimes why we kind of skim over it or we just don't end up talking about it because we're kind of unsure exactly what, what, it's meant, what is meant by it. But there's no doubt that in Matthew's gospel and in the Sermon on the Mount, it is the focal point in Jesus's proclamation. And the broader context of Jesus's ministry is all in that, uh, in, in what he was saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? And this is key in the sermon, the priority of the kingdom that we find in the prayer that he gives to the disciples saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So in the prayer, God's kingdom coming, that's, that's the priority. That's the first thing that you ask for in the prayer. And then in Matthew 6, Jesus says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Right? Food and clothing and shelter, etc., our priorities in God's kingdom is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So what does that mean? Now, um, George Eldon Ladd, he studied uh, the gospel of the kingdom. He studied what the kingdom means. He looked at the original languages, etc. I'm just going to read you a quick quote. He says, the kingdom of God is his kingship, his right, his authority. When this is once realized, we can go through the New Testament and find passage after passage where this meaning is evident, where the kingdom is not a realm or a people, but God's reign. So the kingdom of God means God's reign. So for our priority, it means God reigning, me submitting to God, and God's chosen king is Christ. So the kingdom of God, what it means to to me, is that I need to submit to Christ and obey Christ. That's the kingdom of God. And everyone or anyone who does that can 
enter the kingdom. That's why Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you or in your midst. The way that it comes off in English is a bit vague. It's a, you know, but what it's saying is you have the ability to be part of the kingdom, to be in the kingdom, because you have the ability to say yes to the king. You have the ability to follow the king's commands, to say yes to God, to submit to his rule and reign. Okay. So that's what the kingdom of God is. And that really helps us to make it really just practical and down to earth. It's God's rule through Christ. And that's our priority. That's our priority, to be oriented toward Christ as our king, to be submitted to him, to be obedient to him. That's how we are to pray. That's our priority in life. And then out of that will come righteousness. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. When we live the kingdom way, when we live the king's way, then we'll be living right. We'll have a right relationship with God and we'll have a right relationship with others as well. Okay, This is what Jesus is talking about, kingdom of God. The next main thing, the kingdom way. Okay, So in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, Jesus says, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, one Bible commentator, he said, if the name over the wide gate is self, the one over the straight gate is Christ. You see, the broad way is the way of self-preservation. It's the way of self-exaltation. It's the way that will not crucify the flesh. But the way of Christ is the narrow way. It's the straight gate. And this is the way that submits to the Father's will, that becomes obedient unto death. Right? And what did Jesus say to his disciples? He said, if you want to follow me, right? He said, you have to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow me. So what does it mean to deny yourself and take up our cross? What Jesus showed us. And it, and it shows, uh, Paul says in Philippians 2, he says, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's what it means to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow Jesus. It means to follow his, the way that he lives. And Jesus showed that when he said to the Father in the garden, not my will, but yours be done. This is the narrow way for us as Christians to say, not my will, but yours be done, God. To become obedient even unto death. Okay? And there are many, many martyrs throughout history that did just that. And in Revelation, it says that there are those that did not love their lives unto death. Right? So it means they they didn't love their earthly lives so much that they tried to avoid being a martyr. They gave up their lives. They confessed Christ unto death. Okay, so this is what, this is the narrow way. Christ showed us this way to live, and he's saying, you're going to have to follow me. You're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. And one of the things is, in the church today, there is a kind of false Christianity, a repentance-free Christianity, repentance-free Christianity, where individuals do not humble themselves, they do not repent, they do not change the way they're living, and instead they're told that God wants to, you know, fulfill their calling and help them to improve their lives and reach their full potential, and all of this type of stuff, this is not Christianity. It's not. And in order to live Christ's way, we have to humble ourselves. We have to deny ourselves. So important. Another main theme is the king's warning. Right here. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Let's just stop there. What does it mean to say, Lord? It means that we're servants. 
Jesus is Lord, we're a servant. What did Jesus say to the disciples? You're unprofitable servants, right? When Jesus says to us, do this, don't do that, we just say yes, and we do it or we don't do it. We're unprofitable servants. That's, that's the mindset of the Christian in service to God. But not everyone who says, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? I thought about this. Well, on the Mount of Transfiguration, God says, this is my beloved son, hear him. And that word hear is Shema, right? The idea of Shema in Hebrew, the prophet that you are to hear, just like Moses talked about. And it means hear and obey. So God says, this is my son, hear and obey him. This is why Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He didn't mean perceive what I'm saying as much as he meant, if you can hear what I'm saying, then put it into practice. If you can hear what I'm saying, then do it. That's what Jesus was talking about. And so the king's warning is issued to those who say, Lord, but do not do what Jesus says to do. Okay. And the other thing, uh, Paul says, this is God's will for you, your sanctification. I think that's in First Thessalonians. But the point is God's will for us is our sanctification. And there's this idea, there's this Reformation Protestant idea that we just have a moment of faith and we're justified once and for all. And sanctification is not necessary. That's that's incorrect, okay? Because that whole framework is wrong. We need to return to the gospel of the kingdom and understand what the king's commands are. And what the king says is, if you do not do the Father's will, you won't, you won't be in. You won't be able to enter the kingdom like that. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So, right, think about the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is saying, this is my law. And he says, if you are going to live lawless towards me, I will say, depart from me. You see? If we live lawless towards the king, no. No, we're not going to enter the kingdom. He will say, depart from me. We have to submit to the king. We have to obey the king. We have to be law-abiding citizens in his kingdom. But his kingdom is for people that want to live right. His kingdom is for people that are excited about righteousness, excited about righteous living, excited that God's going to give them the grace and strength to live right, excited that God is going to loose the chains of sin and free them through Christ. Is that not exciting? That's exciting, but for some people, it's not. And these people are the ones that are in danger. And Jesus finishes by saying, to build on his words, his teachings, that will be the rock that you can be secure on. All other ground is sinking sand. And it ends with Jesus's authority, King Jesus. When Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Okay? And I looked up this word authority. It means the power or right to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. King Jesus is here to say, this is the way to live in my kingdom. And if you don't want to live that way, you will not be in my kingdom. That's exactly what he's saying. Now, if we want to live in his kingdom, if we want to live right, then we can rejoice because we have a good and righteous king. But if we don't want to live right, then we should fear because the king doesn't mess around. Now, this might be just like completely new, but listen, if you have not watched the apostolic preaching video, go back and watch that. We have to recover the gospel of the kingdom, 
the kingdom lifestyle, the, the way of the kingdom. And guys, listen, I'm not, you know, I'm not Mr. Super Christian guy over here. I've, I've, it's taken me years to figure this stuff out. And the more that I learn, the smaller I get, you know, I, I'm, I'm nothing really. And I fear God. We need to fear God. We need the fear of the Lord. And this is why Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Okay. We, that's exactly what we need to do. We need to stand in awe of the king, reverence the king, obey the king, lay down our lives for him. That is the Christian way. There's no other way. So I hope that this has challenged you and blessed you. And guys, listen, we're in it together. Let's give our lives to the king. Let's serve the king wholeheartedly. That's my heart's desire. And uh, yeah, we're on this journey together, okay? There's grace. There's mercy. Come to the throne of grace in, in our time of need for mercy and grace. We can go to him. So I really want to encourage you guys to keep going. Keep going. And uh, yeah, love you all. And see you guys back here soon.